a recent study, nearly one third of black Americans are hesitant to get the COVID-19 vaccine. Now, we know COVID can be deadly and we know that the disease has disproportionately affected black communities. So you might be wondering, why are one third of black Americans suddenly anti-vaxxers? How did we get here? Well, we'd like to answer that question for you in a segment called, How Did We Get Here? of you who don't know, anti-vaxxers are people who are anti-vaccine. Measles, mumps, chicken pox, you name it. If there's a disease that scientists have worked hard to eradicate over the last century, anti-vaxxers have worked to bring it back. In 2019, the World Health Organization named them one of the top 10 global health threats, right after people who cut the seatbelts out of cars. The anti-vax movement has been mostly dominated by rich white people who read a book written by an actress named Jenny McCarthy in 2007 that claimed vaccines were unsafe, which explains the list of credits on her IMDP page. Until now, being anti-vaccine has mostly been a white thing, like cargo shorts or taking a shower without a washcloth. So why are so many black people disinterested in taking the COVID-19 vaccine? It's because America has a big, big problem with medical racism. Now, I know what you're thinking. America? Racist? That sounds about right. But how is medical racism different from regular old everyday racism? Well, the main difference is that instead of some random person being racist to you for free, you pay a doctor to do it. Black people aren't usually known for being anti-vaccine, but a lot of us are anti taking the vaccine first because there is a long history of doctors experimenting on black people to figure out ways to help white people. For example, many of the practices in modern day gynecology come from experimenting on slaves. The gynecologist is not fun in 2021, so you know the very first speculum was bad. But even after slavery ended, scientists were taught that black bodies and minds were inferior and because of this, that their bodies belonged to science, even if it was against their will. Now, I didn't say they thought black minds and bodies were inferior. I said they were taught this. It was part of their curriculum. It came between how to turn on a Bunsen burner and how to get stains out of your lab coat. In 1932, the United States Public Health Service conducted the Tuskegee study of untreated syphilis in the Negro male. Scientists from the U.S. government decided they wanted to see what happens to black men when syphilis is left untreated. This is what our government decided to focus on in 1932. Gerald, should we solve the Great Depression? We could, or hear me out, we could conduct this insane experiment. Now, what human being would just sign up to let syphilis kill them? The answer is no damn body. So they got 600 black men to participate in that study by lying to them. The men thought they were being treated, and instead the government gave them fake medicine and just let them die, which may sound unbelievable, but take a look around America today. Letting people die is kind of our government's thing. The Tuskegee experiment remained a secret until a whistleblower leaked the information in 1972, and that's when the study was finally shut down. 1972, that is not that long ago. We got rid of this hairstyle before we got rid of that study. And if you think that story is crazy, hold on to your butts because after the Tuskegee study, there was Henrietta Lacks, a black woman who was dying from cervical cancer in 1951. Doctors harvested her cells without her permission so they could use them to do medical research. And those cells are still used by scientists to this day. Her family didn't find out about the cell harvesting until 1975, and they received zero compensation. Then a bunch of people wrote books and an HBO movie about her, and her family didn't receive any of that money either. And you know HBO plays that movie every February. A lot of the examples I'm giving happened years ago, but the effects of those events are still felt today. A study in 2016 revealed that 40% of white medical students believe that black people's skin is thicker than white people's and that as a result, we feel less pain. Thicker skin metaphorically? No, do not make fun of me or I will cry. Thicker skin physically? Also no, I bruise easily and again, I will cry. White doctors thinking black folks actually have thicker skin and feel less pain helps explain why black babies are twice as likely to die during childbirth as white babies. Because doctors literally don't take black women's pain seriously. Racism is woven into the fabric of American medicine. 
Black people aren't suspicious of the COVID vaccine because we read a book by Jenny McCarthy, a book I can only assume is mostly pictures. We're suspicious because we've read our history. Now, personally, I hope every American gets the vaccine as quickly as possible so we can put this whole nightmare behind us. And I hope communities of color will be prioritized when they roll it out. But I also can't blame the black community for being suspicious of scientists because this is how we got here. Lately, there's been a lot of talk about systemic racism. Everyone claims they want to fix it, but we can't even agree on what it is. We just know it's bad, like poverty or pollution or the way white people dance. But systemic racism isn't just an idea, it's a real thing. There's a place where you can go and see real live systemic racism right in front of you. It's called The Hood. I'm sure you've heard about it. Your favorite rapper grew up there. You've probably seen movies about it. In a movie, you can tell you're in the hood because there's always rap music playing in the background when the brave white savior goes there to drag Jamal away from the gang so he can play in the big chess tournament. But have you ever wondered how the hood got that way? Systemic racism, that's how. In the 1930s, America was in the thick of the Great Depression. The banks had failed and everyone had lost their homes and unemployment was at the highest it would ever be until this idiot came along. So FDR had an idea called the New Deal. The New Deal gave jobs to nearly every American, set the minimum wage, and created a retirement plan called Social Security, and it worked. For the first time in American history, you could have a regular job and make a decent living. You wouldn't necessarily be rich, but you wouldn't be poor either. They called it the middle class. To get that kind of job security today, you would need three jobs and an OnlyFans account. Now, if you're wondering if this New Deal made things better for black people, the answer is, See, part of the New Deal was the Homeowners Loan Corporation. They were an organization that guaranteed home loans for everyone. But just like an episode of Friends, they didn't include black people. How could they separate the white applicants from the black applicants? They didn't have to. Segregation did that for them. Because of segregation laws, black people could only live in certain areas. So the United States government drew up color-coded maps for nearly every city in America and told the banks, we'll guarantee loans for everyone who lives anywhere except in the red areas. Those just so happened to be the areas where black people lived. Like how the only thing behind glass at Walgreens just so happens to be Miss Jessie's. They created a system based on racism to make sure black people couldn't be a part of this middle class. They came up with a name for it, too. They called it redlining. We called it the hood. But that's way in the past, right? Like Downton Abbey phones and these pants. What does that have to do with now? Well, how many of you watching right now live in or know someone who lives in a home that their parents or grandparents owned? That's called generational wealth. And Home ownership is the number one driver of wealth in America. Number two, of course, is how many Beanie Babies you have. You can use a home to pay for college or start a business or, you know, not be homeless. But if you look at almost any major American city, most of the formerly redlined areas are still majority black and low income. That's because banks didn't stop doing this until, oh, hold on, let me look it up. Let's see, when did banks stop? They never stopped. Homes in majority black neighborhoods are valued at 25% lower than homes in white areas, even when the crime rate and the neighborhood amenities are exactly the same. And because school funding is based on home values, the average non-white school district receives $2,226 less per student than a white school district, which is why the gym in a public school in a black neighborhood looks like this, and the gym at a white school looks like this. There's even studies that show schools in black neighborhoods have smaller libraries. Meanwhile, at the white school, they're checking out Encyclopedia Brown from here. And because wealth and education are the number one factors for crime, police are more likely to patrol these neighborhoods, which is why even though there is no difference in the rate of drug use between white and black people, let me say that again. There is no difference in the rate of drug use between white and black people. Black people are three and a half times more likely to be arrested for drugs. It's like a reverse Hunger Games, where the odds are never in your favor. Most drug arrests occur in redlined areas, and studies show courts hand out 20% longer sentences to black people who commit the same crimes as white people. Wait, maybe that's why white people dance like that. It's the dance of a person with no consequences. 
So maybe all of this is why the average white family has 10 times the wealth of a black family. Not because black people like Jordans and shiny rims, but because there is a system designed specifically to make it true. Home ownership in America is more rigged than a basketball hoop at Coney Island. And maybe that's why black people are always rapping and bragging about where we come from. We're not celebrating the hood. We're letting you know that we survived a system that took our free labor and our tax dollars and gave it to everyone but us. We're telling the world in no uncertain terms that y'all can't kill us and we won't die. So if you want to know what systemic racism looks like, just go to the hood and tell Jamal good luck at the chess tournament. It's Black History Month, yay! Every morning this month, I wake up and look to see what's waiting for me under the Tubman tree. Will it be a white person telling me what Martin Luther King would have wanted? Or better yet, someone saying, why do we need a Black History Month? How would you like it if we had a white history month? You might be thinking that's crazy. The only reason we know about such notable white achievements as Betsy Ross's apparently groundbreaking ability to use a needle and thread or Paul Revere's remarkable ability to scream and ride a horse at the same time is because every month is White History Month. But hear me out. I think we do need a White History Month because the American history that's taught in schools is so whitewashed, we don't learn the real story. We learn lies like George Washington chopping down a cherry tree, but not the fact that George had 18 slaves before he turned 18. 18 slaves. When I was 18, I didn't have 18 shirts. I had three shirts and they all looked like this. <laughs> Each one of them, cuter than the last. We learned that Abraham Lincoln said four score and seven years ago, but not that he said, I am not nor ever have been in favor of bringing about in any way the social and political equality of the black and white races. There must be the position of superior and inferior, and I am in favor of having the superior position assigned to the white race. They don't put that on the penny, partially because it would make the penny too long, and Partly because our schools don't teach an honest version of American history. And that's why we need White History Month. History shouldn't just be a list of names and dates. It's supposed to give us context for the present. How can we learn about Harriet Tubman and Frederick Douglass and MLK's response to inequality without understanding the true history of the country that enshrined that inequality into law? For example, in regular history, they tell you the Second Amendment was created to protect against tyranny. But during White History Month, you would learn the truth, that the right to bear arms was added to the Constitution so white men could keep their slaves in check. That is a true fact. See how much we're learning? White History Month is fun. I hope you're taking notes in your White History Month trapper keeper. See. At the time the Constitution was written, most states required every able-bodied man who lived there to serve on a slave patrol. These states had posses of white men to keep black people in line. And in the 1700s, they didn't have the kind of advanced adhesive technologies we have now. So slaves couldn't wear name tags. So the slave patroller guys just stopped every black person. Over time, those slave patrols eventually evolved into militias, and during the Revolutionary War, those militias became the American army. And when the war ended, America had a bunch of roving bands of men who had guns, so they put those men in charge of putting down slave rebellions. And eventually, they put them in charge of enforcing all the laws, or as they called it back then, policing. If you're still taking notes, I bet your trapper keeper just exploded. Now, when the Southern states decided they'd rather own human beings than be part of America, these militias became the Confederate Army. And after the Civil War, the militias came back home with nothing to do. So a few of them started a fun fraternity called the Circle of Brothers. Now, you've probably never heard of the Circle of Brothers fraternity because they always lost at the homecoming step shows. Plus, they used their Greek name, Kuklos, meaning circle, and of course, clan, meaning family. You call them the Ku Klux Klan. That's who enforced racial terrorism during Reconstruction. That's who used violence to enforce Jim Crow laws. That's who carried out the lynchings during the Red Summer of 1919. Google it. That's who still stops and frisks black people at 10 times the rate of white people. That's who still shoots and kills unarmed black citizens at three and a half times the rate of whites. Because for most of America's history, there's been no difference between the Klan, the police, and plain old racists. So why don't we all know this? 
because while Southern men were busy forming the KKK, Southern women were busy forming a fun club called the United Daughters of the Confederacy. The United Daughters joined school boards and formed lobbying groups to make textbooks more favorable to Confederates. And they got so powerful that textbook publishers had to get their approval before school boards agreed to purchase social studies books, ensuring that their version of history is the one that got taught in schools. It is impossible to understand politics, the black community's relationship with the police, or why we even need to say Black Lives Matter if we don't learn the history of this country. So yes, let's have a white history month. Let's have 12 of them. Otherwise, we'll never learn information that's crucial to understanding our own country. Like the fact that once upon a time, there were slave patrols who became militias, who became revolutionary army, who became the police, who became the Confederate army, who became the KKK. Just because they don't teach that in schools doesn't mean you can't learn it. But you're gonna need a lot more trapper keepers. America is known for three things, baseball, apple pie, and not spending money on social services. We're one of the richest nations in the world, but we don't have a lot of cool things other developed countries have, like the ability to go to the dentist without taking out a loan. But how did we get here? Let's find out in a segment called, How Did We Get Here? It seems like these days, no one can agree on anything. Is climate change real? Should we double mask? Does sugar belong on grits? Well, apparently, all this division is caused by this thing called economic anxiety. I'm sure you've heard of it. It's a euphemism that describes a whole set of confusing beliefs. People with economic anxiety love small government, but are happy to spend billions on prisons or a border wall. They hate regulations, but they love to regulate women's bodies. The myth of economic anxiety has been around since slavery because America loves a euphemism. That's why we call it climate change instead of everybody gonna drown if y'all stop playing. It's why we call Woody Allen a director instead of an alleged child molester who is also very ugly. But economic anxiety and all the things it's a euphemism for are caused by a concept called the zero sum fallacy. That's the belief that one person's gain means another person's loss. Think of America as a pie. This should be an easy analogy to follow because at any given moment, 90% of Americans are eating pie. Basically, economically anxious people think that when anyone else gets a piece of pie, there must be less pie to go around. They believe that if everyone gets health care, insurance premiums will rise, or if we raise minimum wages, companies will lay off workers, or if we spend more money on public education, then the police won't have money for bare essentials like this. Now, to me, the benefits of spending money on social services is clear. It's obvious we should be doing it, just like it's obvious we should all watch Bridgerton alone when our husband isn't home. But many Americans don't feel that way. They get nervous about spending money on services that benefit all Americans. But that wasn't always the case. According to a recent New York Times article, in 1960, 70% of white Americans believed that the government ought to guarantee a job for anyone who wants one and ensure a minimum standard of living for everyone in the country. By 1964, that number had dropped to just 35%. Now, what could have happened between 1960 and 1964 to change the way white people felt? What could it have been? Can you guys think of anything? That's right. When white Americans thought the social safety net was for them, they were all for it. But when it started to look like black Americans might also get a piece of that pie, they changed their mind. Fortunately, very few economic systems are modeled after desserts. In fact, it's the opposite. You get more pie when you share more pie. Take minimum wage, for example. Studies show that companies that pay a living wage actually make more money. And then the people making a living wage boost the economy by spending money on things like food and clothes and whatever this is. If everyone had health care, hospitals wouldn't have to overcharge people to make up for patients who don't have health care. The surest way to lower costs is to insure more people. It's also the surest way to stop people from Googling, can I take my own appendix out at home? Do you ever wonder why there's a lot less crime in rich neighborhoods? It's because crime is caused by poverty, poor education, and lack of resources. So if we spend more money on education, mental health services, and job training, 
crime will go down. Now, where will we get all this extra money from? Well, since we already know that investing in these things lowers crime, how about using some of the big pile of money sitting in police funding? If only there was a name for this economic concept. Oh well, more education and job training means more people making a living wage, which means more tax revenue, which means more pie, which is great because, as we've already established, Americans love pie. Now, people with economic anxiety will call these things government handouts, but they're not worried about the government handing money out. They're worried about who the government is handing money to. They only want it to go to certain people. Well, guess what? That's all of our money. It comes from the taxes we all pay, and we all deserve a piece of that pie, no matter your race, gender, sexuality, or creed, even if your creed is Apollo. In fact, the only way we will ever get rid of economic anxiety is if we stop hoarding so much damn pie. Unless, of course, economic anxiety was just racism all along. Last Sunday, Oprah interviewed Meghan Markle and Prince Harry about their experience stepping back from the royal family. And a lot of the interview was about the pain Meghan had suffered at the hands of the British press. They are truly evil to her. That whole country talks about Meghan like she stole their man, which <laughs> I guess she did. Now, I look at Meghan Markle and I see a nice lady in well-tailored clothes, but when the press writes about that same woman, all of a sudden she's difficult, not appropriate, unsuitable as a wife, and my favorite, uppity. Huh, uppity. I wonder why they chose that word. I think I can explain in a segment called, How Did We Get Here? Listen, I'll be the first to admit that I'm not quite up on my British culture. Until recently, I thought Earl was a title bestowed on the oldest man in any auto mechanic shop. But I do know a dog whistle when I hear one. A dog whistle is coded language that's used to insult a group of people while maintaining deniability to the audience at large. Dog whistles use language that sounds normal to the majority of people, but that communicates a very specific, very shitty message to a smaller, intended audience. For example, the dictionary definition of uppity is self-important or arrogant, but that word is exclusively used to describe black people who supposedly don't know their place. I've never heard a white person be called uppity in my entire life. But then again, I work in television, so maybe I just don't know any self-important white people. So when you say uppity, you can pretend you're just calling someone self-important in a race-neutral way, but we all know what you're really saying is that they think of themselves too highly for a black person. It especially gets used to describe black people who ask to be treated the same as white people, which isn't a lot to ask, especially when you're a literal freaking princess. Isn't finding yourself important exactly what being royal is? Oh, so only white princesses get to order birds to brush their hair? Let Megan have her birds. There are a million dog whistles like this, and they all essentially mean a different version of the same thing. So when tabloids call Meghan Markle uppity or exotic or duchess difficult, what they're really saying is she's black and we don't like that. And it makes us crazy when you're black and fancy because fancy is supposed to be our thing. But dog whistles aren't just a British thing. Americans might not be great at men's fashion or men's soccer, but we are amazing at dog whistles. Like when Trump told voters that low income housing was going to destroy the suburbs, he was saying, Black people are gonna move into your white neighborhoods and you should be scared. They could season your food or teach your women to dance. Or when Trump planned a rally in Tulsa on Juneteenth, people who didn't know the significance of Tulsa were like, okay. But racists heard that dog whistle and were like, Rrr? As far as ways to be racist go, dog whistles are a great strategy for politicians because you get to be racist and pretend you're not. And when black people get mad about the obvious racism, you get to call them politically correct for canceling you over something you definitely, wink, wink, weren't doing. You get to have your racist cake and eat it too. And you know that cake is dry as hell and the kitchen was not clean when they made it. And if you're wondering if there are dog whistles that exclusively apply to white people, well, there are, and they're my favorite kind. 
If you hear anyone say Patriots, they're talking about white people or the New England football team, which in which case they're still talking about white people. When politicians say working class, they mean working class white people, also known as blue collar people, diner patrons or Bruce Springsteen fans. Black voters are black voters, but white voters are soccer moms or NASCAR dads or evangelicals or value voters. Apparently, only white people play soccer or have values. Just don't say white people. They hate that. Because white people are people. They get to have individuality and complex backstories that you have to empathize with in order to understand their choices. And when black people ask to be treated that way, we're uppity. There are too many of these terms for me to cover. If you want to learn them all, you'll have to download Duolingo. Or you can just read one single article about Meghan Markle, because they're all in there. And while we're back on the subject, I'd like to take a second to talk about Meghan and Harry using absolutely no dog whistles. Meghan and Harry are grown-ups who can do whatever they want. They are hot and young and rich, and they know Oprah. But most importantly, they are minding their own dang business. Meghan Markle's life literally does not affect you in any way. So if you hate Meghan, you need to take a hard look at yourself and ask why. Is it because she ruined your high school fantasy of marrying a prince who never knew you existed? Or is it that the world has taught you that black girls are worthless and seeing Meghan being loved so fiercely makes you angry? Harry would rather be her husband than your prince and it makes you sick. Meghan Markle is smart and classy and brave, and she's a better princess than we deserve. And if you're mad at her, if you think you deserve a better princess than her, that's the definition of uppity. Earlier this week, a gunman murdered eight people, including six Asian women, in a hate crime in Atlanta. Our hearts go out to the families and communities affected by this violence. No one should have to experience the pain they are going through. And this event didn't come out of nowhere. How did we get here? Let's find out in a segment called, How Did We Get Here? America has a long and well-documented history of anti-Asian racism. But during the coronavirus pandemic, violent attacks against Asian Americans have increased by 150%. Asian Americans have reported street harassment, attacks on their elders, and vandalism of their businesses. One hole in Texas graffitied a ramen shop. Do you know how stupid and racist you have to be to get mad at soup? Especially when that soup is delicious? Get a grip, racists. Now, it's really impossible, Trump, to say, Trump, why something like that Trump would happen. But I do know that anti-Asian violence spiked after Trump and other Republicans started referring to the coronavirus as the China virus and other racist terms. And it doesn't surprise me that this kind of rhetoric would lead to an increase in violence, partly because I have the common sense God gave a housefly, and partly because America has a long, violent history of scapegoating Asian people, which I, a comedian, will now try to tell you about in the five minutes I have between commercials because the American school system has failed us all. Anti-Asian racism in the U.S. falls into a weird duality. On one hand, there's the model minority myth. Well off and middle class Asians are seen as the good, successful minorities. Their success is so-called proof that racism doesn't exist and that other minorities just aren't working as hard. But also, their success is not fair because they're keeping good white kids with a B-minus average out of Harvard by using the totally dishonest trick of having better grades. Now. It's the dumbest, whitest thing to have a theory that proves your country isn't racist that is actually a hierarchy of races. Obviously, not all Asian Americans are well-off Harvard students, and that's where the double-sided trap of anti-Asian racism comes in. On the one hand, you've got the model minority myth, and on the other, the yellow peril myth, the myth that Asian people are somehow a threat to the Western world. Since the first working-class Asian immigrants arrived in the U.S., they've been seen as disposable labor. In the 1860s, Chinese immigrants arrived to build the Transcontinental Railroad for one-third of the pay of white workers. Well, Chinese men did. Chinese women weren't allowed to immigrate because, and I wish I was making this up, they didn't want Chinese people to fall in love here, get married, and stay. What kind of evil empire tries to outlaw love? That is some Darth Vader Death Star sh**. Asian workers have been the targets of violence and lynchings throughout history. In 1871, during the Chinese massacre, 
10% of LA's Chinese residents were killed. In 1885 in Rock Springs, Wyoming, 28 Chinese coal miners were murdered and the city's Chinatown was burned down. Oh, and fun fact, at the time it was illegal for an Asian person to testify in court against a white person. I know that wasn't an actual fun fact, but it's the closest we're gonna get in this segment. In 1900, one Asian person was suspected of having the plague and the city of San Francisco put up barbed wire and literally quarantined the entire Chinese population in Chinatown, while in other areas, people just burned Chinese neighborhoods down. I told you these facts would not be fun, but they are plentiful. In 1882, the U.S. passed the Chinese Exclusion Act, the first time the country barred people from immigration based on race. But not the last time, because if there's one thing America loves to do, it's keep people out. We're like the bouncer of countries. During World War II, the United States imprisoned Japanese people, including children, because they thought they might be loyal to the Japanese government. Which is funny, because when I think of groups who aren't loyal to the U.S. government, that's not who I think of. What I'm trying to say is Donald Trump is an asshole, but he's not an inventor. He ain't done nothing new. He simply tapped into America's long, violent history of dehumanizing Asian Americans. Now, there's been a lot of talk this week about what we should all do in the wake of violence in Atlanta, but I'd like to talk for a minute about what we're not gonna do. What we're not gonna do is disrespect the lives that were lost this week by acting like words don't matter. What we're not gonna do is act like Asian hate doesn't run deep in this country. America does not get to hide from its racist past or present. And what we're not gonna do is act like white supremacy isn't at the root of all this. Contrary to everything this country was built on, white men don't get to decide who lives and who dies. White people don't get to decide our humanity. Dismantling white supremacy starts with white people admitting they have a big problem. And black people will continue to stand in solidarity with our Asian family because white supremacy is killing us, all of us. I remember last summer when people from all over were protesting and saying, protect black women, Black Lives Matter. Seeing that felt really great. And I want that feeling for you, so just to be extra explicit, we hate this, it's not right. Your feelings are valid, you deserve to feel safe, you deserve to be safe, we love you. This has been How Did We Get Here? We are so saddened by the tragic events in Boulder this week, and we're also frustrated because the majority of Americans are in favor of stricter gun laws, but stricter gun laws will never pass because of a thing called the filibuster. And that's not the only damage the filibuster has caused. Let's find out why else it's bad in a segment called, How Did We Get Here? A filibuster is an action that a senator can take to keep the Senate from voting on a bill. There are 100 senators, so if any one of them introduces a bill, any of the other 99 can stop it from getting voted on. It's basically legislative blocking. I'm sorry, is that sexist blocking? Can we say blocking on TV? We just did. So senators stop bills from getting voted on a lot, which is crazy because voting is their job. It would be like if at any point in the day, one of your coworkers could stand up on his desk and say, I don't think we should ship office supplies to the Southwest region today. And then you all had to stop working and watch him give a speech about it. Meanwhile, I'm at home refreshing my tracking information like, where's my damn stapler? I have papers to connect. The filibuster is just a long-winded way to keep things from getting done, and it isn't even in the Constitution. It was created in 1806 by Aaron Burr, the bad guy from Hamilton. Leslie, I love you, and you can get it, and I'm willing to wait for it. But the filibuster didn't start to become what we know it as now until 1841, when Senator John Calhoun realized it could be used to protect minority rights, which he defined as my right to own minorities. Calhoun wanted to ensure that the slave-owning minority of senators would be able to override the majority of senators who didn't own slaves so they could protect slavery. So on the surface, the filibuster seems fine, but if you look closer, it's very racist, just like Mel Gibson. 
Originally, in order to filibuster, you had to stand up and talk the whole time. So while you could delay a bill, all filibusters eventually ended when the dude got sleepy or had to pee or had to go polish his top hat. I, I don't know what people did back then. The point is, at some point, the filibuster used to end, but that changed during the Jim Crow era. Now, anytime a story skips from slavery times to Jim Crow times, you know it's not going anywhere good. In 1917, Rule 22 was introduced. Rule 22 requires a supermajority of senators to stop a filibuster. Sounds good, right? It even has the word super in it. But in practice, until 1964, the supermajority was only used to stop civil rights legislation. That means that every other bill could pass with 51 votes, but civil rights bills effectively needed 67 to get past the inevitable filibuster. Isn't that crazy? It's like, oh, no, 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 it's a totally neutral thing. It just somehow only ever gets used to hurt black people, you know, like police. The record for the longest one-man filibuster is held by Strom Thurmond, who also holds the record for most racist-sounding name. <laughs> they may as well have named him Segregation O Confederate. In 1957, Thurmond filibustered the Civil Rights Act for 24 hours. Do you know how much you have to hate someone to stand on your feet and talk for a whole day? I have several terrible ex-boyfriends and the longest I can go on any one of them is 15 minutes. After that, I'm too tired to keep caring. Even civil rights bills that should pass easily get caught up by filibusters. There are 200 anti-lynching bills that haven't been passed by the Senate. 200! We can get millions of Americans to make their own sourdough bread, but we can't get 60 to vote against lynching. Ugh, even crazier, these days, senators don't even have to show up to work to filibuster. Any senator can send an email, and if 60 other senators don't feel like challenging it, that's enough to filibuster a bill. And the senator doesn't even have to tell the American people why. And I think they should. If you're getting paid by my tax dollars to not make lynching illegal, I want you to have to stand up there and say why. And I want you to be wearing really pointy, uncomfortable shoes when you do it. Also, I'm sure every speech would start out with some pretty language about states' rights or something, but there is no way a racist can talk that long without saying something racist. And I want to see it. I think it would be funny. So now you're thinking, OK, just because the filibuster started out racist and then was only used to be racist for a long time, that doesn't mean it's racist now, right? Oh, you sweet summer child. It's true that these days the filibuster is used for a wider variety of issues, but any guesses on when Republicans set the record for doing the most filibusters? Can you guess who was in office? I'll give you one more guess. That's right. So the filibuster is like when you see a white person buying brown makeup on Halloween, technically they could be using it for anything, but they're probably going to do a racism. So that's how we got to where we are now. Thanks in large part to the filibuster, we are still struggling with black people's voting rights. Don't believe me? Ask Representative Park Cannon, the Georgia lawmaker who got arrested just for knocking on the door of someone who was trying to pass a voter suppression law. She got charged with a felony. Just kidding, she got charged with two. Can you imagine telling someone marching in the 60s that we still wouldn't have this stuff figured out by 2021? They'd be so disappointed. Then they'd be like, but you guys have flying cars, right? And you'd have to be like, oh, no, but we have automatic sinks, but they don't recognize black people. Sorry, the future is bad. The filibuster is keeping black Americans from having full voting rights, and it's keeping all Americans from being safe from gun violence. And frankly, the word itself sounds very stupid. Democrats should get rid of it, or at least make senators see how long they can talk without letting the N-word slip out. This has been How Did We Get Here?